I'm very pleased to welcome you all here to tonight's debate on the question of if abortion harms women. I would like to extend a special welcome to students joining us from various medical schools across the country. Abortion can be a charged issue, so I'd like to thank you all in advance for your respectful participation in this event. The University of Toronto administration has asked us to remind you that the university's policy on the disruption of meetings applies to this event. There will be a time for questions at the end of the debate. Before I invite up our moderator, I'd just like to note a few things. You should have received a feedback form when you came in. Please fill it out at the end of the debate and hand it to us as you leave the auditorium later tonight. Secondly, this debate is being filmed. <coughs> Finally, please turn off all cell phones and pagers or put them on the silent or vibrate so that there will be no disruptions during this event. Our moderator for the evening is Dr. Bouchard, a family physician from Calgary. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage to introduce himself as well as, well as our speakers for the evening. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. And thank you Stephanie and Dr. Fellows for um, having this debate with us. And uh, just so you're aware, um, Dr. Fellows and Stephanie did have coffee beforehand um, to discuss and prepare and I think that's a good example to all of us and kind of the spirit and, and tone that we should have when we come to something contentious like this. We should be able to go for coffee with anybody else in this room, regardless of their position, to be able to confront each other on a human level and say, you know, this is my view, let me hear you out, and, and be respectful, uh, humble in our own views, and be able to listen to the other person. Um, even if you totally disagree with them, I think it's just in a spirit of respect, I think that's the way we should communicate as individuals. So. Um, I'll just go through a little bit of the um, rules of the debate and I'll just mention before I forget that uh, there is a Twitter feed. The hashtag is gray with an A, fellows debate. Um, so um, please don't shout out loud, but shout out on Twitter as much as you'd like. So um, I'm, I'm just going to give you a little bit of info about how things will go. Each of our debaters will have a 20 minute opening statement and will come to the podium to deliver their opening statement. After that there will be a cross-examination and just so you're aware of the cross-examination period, the um, other debater has the, the ability to ask questions and they can also interrupt their opponent. Uh, and it's just the, the way that the cross-examination can happen. Um, and during the cross-examination, that's not the time for our audience questions, that will come a little bit later and I'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, but the cross-examination for each of them will be seven minutes and then each will have time for a rebuttal for ten minutes and then they'll each have a five minute closing statement and after that we'll have questions. So I'm just going to give our debaters a 30 second um, brief intro, I'll let them do that. So. Um, Stephanie Gray and Dr. Fraser Fellows, can you give yourselves an intro? Stephanie Gray. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform, and I originally hail. 
Gail from Chilliwack, British Columbia, and recently moved this year to the Greater Toronto area. And as director of CCBR, I do a lot of education with my colleagues to the culture about the issue of abortion. And particularly, my role is to uh, present at uh, high schools, churches, universities, and other institutions about abortion, and uh, where there's an interest engaged in public debates like this one. Thank you very much. So, um, my job is to enforce time limits, and um, I'm not very good at enforcing other things. Um, I was trained as a physician, not as a bouncer, so um, <laughs> please don't make me use my muscles because I don't have many. So, um, without further ado, I am going to let, I think Stephanie, you're going to go first, take the floor for our opening statement that will be 20 minutes. to her 
her tear-stained face be? Well, you know, it wasn't a baby anyways, and it's really what's supposed to happen when a woman's pregnant. Miscarriage is the natural, normal end result of pregnancy. Would that be your reaction? Or would it be to acknowledge something went wrong here? Now, I ask you to think about this little thought experiment because I think it appeals to our intuitions. We know that pregnancy, whether desired or not, is a normal, healthy function of a woman's body. Miscarriage is not. It's a sign of something gone wrong as opposed to a sign of something going right. Here's why that's important. When we try to figure out whether abortion harms women, we need to acknowledge that it is a surgical procedure that is not medically indicated. There is no medical necessity, and yet we're doing a medical procedure that will have consequences, as does all surgery, for a woman who has no pathology, for a woman whose body is functioning right. So it seems to me that if we ask, is abortion harmful to women, the obvious answer would be yes. But perhaps it's not so obvious for some women who would say, I had an abortion, it didn't harm me physically, it didn't harm me emotionally, so therefore you're wrong that abortion harms women. And for someone who would say that, I have no rebuttal. Because I cannot make a woman feel something that she does not feel. But nor can that woman make another woman not feel something that she does feel. Nor can that woman look at another woman and say, you didn't have the physical consequence that she actually does. So does abortion harm all women? No. At least from the perspective of each woman. Some will say, it did not harm me. But at a basic level, abortion is most certainly harmful to some women. And that is the case that I will be presenting this evening. What I'm going to do is look at the physical harm of abortion as well as the emotional harms of abortion. There's a TED Talk by author Simon Sinek. And Simon Sinek gives a TED presentation not on health matters or abortion-related matters, but on business. And his TED Talk is about a book he wrote, which is entitled Start With Why. And his premise is that good organizations and good businesses start with why, to help their employees and all those who are involved really understand what they're involved with. Because if you understand why, it's easier to accept the what and the how. Now I bring that up because when I get into bringing forth the evidence about how abortion harms women physically and how abortion can harm some women emotionally, I'm going to start each of those sections with why. I want us to consider intuitively just basic bio, her biology in order to understand that the evidence I will then be presenting makes sense in light of the why. So why would abortion harm a woman physically, such as with breast cancer? A very controversial point I acknowledge for someone to make. So let's start with why. Let's look at the biology. One thing that isn't disputed is that a risk factor for breast cancer is exposure to estrogen. It is well accepted that if a woman starts her menstrual cycles very young, or they go on very late before she goes uh, into menopause, uh, if she delays having her first child, uh, if she has no children, and if she doesn't breastfeed her children, all of these things are factors which contribute to her risk for breast cancer. Why? Because of estrogen exposure. In each of those uh, situations, the woman will have more menstrual cycles and therefore greater exposure to estrogen. That's not a controversial claim to make, even though the abortion breast cancer link is a controversial claim to make. So let's stay for a moment thinking about why it could be possible that there could be a link here. So starting with this idea that there's a, there's a link between estrogen exposure and breast cancer, now let's consider the body of a woman who's pregnant. When a woman is pregnant, her estrogen levels skyrocket in a form of estrogen called estradiol. And this causes the cells in her breast 
to multiply at a very rapid rate. At that point in her first pregnancy, the kinds of cells within a woman's breast are type 1 and type 2 lobules. These do not become type 3 or type 4 lobules until the 32nd week of pregnancy. Now here is why that is significant. Type 1 and type 2 lobules are where cancers arise. Type 3 and type 4 lobules are mature and they are resistant to carcinogens. So that is significant because the vast majority of abortions happen long before the 32nd week of pregnancy, when those type 1 and type 2 lobules will, after, after multiplying and dividing, will now become type 3 and type 4 lobules. But you unnaturally cut that pregnancy off, and you leave those breast cells in a very vulnerable state, and only in the type 1 and type 2 category, where they, again they are more uh, um, likely to develop to cancer. So that is significant then when we look at studies, because I realize it's one thing to say, well, why would it be possible for a woman to have an increased risk of breast cancer if she has an abortion? But is the evidence there to actually back that up? And I certainly believe that you can't just make a claim, you want to back it up with evidence. Well, what I'm holding in my hand is a list of epidemiological studies induced abortion and breast cancer risk all the way up to 2013 and as far back as 1957. There are a total of 73 studies and there are 57 which have a positive correlation between abortion and breast cancer and 34 of these are statistically significant. 34 of these are statistically significant showing this link between abortion and breast cancer. Not only is there that physical risk with abortion, but there's the physical risk of preterm birth. In other words, aborting your first child could cause harm to your second. Let's again start with why. How could this be possible before we look at the evidence? Well, when a woman is pregnant, her cervix is tightly closed. So for that surgical abortion to happen, it has to be forced open. That can result in infection when, when uh, surgical instruments go in. It can result in uh, cervical incompetence, so that when she's pregnant in subsequent pregnancies, that cervix, which had been forced open in the first pregnancy, is now going to open sooner rather than at the end of the pregnancy for birth. It's going to open earlier, and so she could have a miscarriage or a preterm birth, and so the next child is going to have the consequences that come from a preterm birth, such as cerebral Palsy. Well, let's look at the studies that back this up. There were 20 studies between 1973 and 1999 in seven different countries that point to a statistically significant increased risk of preterm births and abortion, uh, published in the Obstetrics and Gynecology Journal uh, of Epidemiology. Sorry, it was published, one of the 22 studies was in Obstetrics and Gynecology the Journal. The next journal was Journal of Epidemiology and the New England Journal of Medicine, those are three of the 22 journals that had published studies which showed a statistically significant risk of preterm birth as a result of uh, a woman previously having had an abortion. Then the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons in 2008 published a study in which they reported between 1980 and 2005, the United States preterm birth rate rose by 43%. Black women, compared to non-black women, have a triple risk of preterm birth and four times the risk of extreme preterm birth. In 2004, 38.2% of United States surgical abortions were performed on black women who comprise only 12.5% of the population amongst females. They comprise only 12.5% and yet they have 38.2% of the abortions, and there's a very high and growing rate of abortions, a uh, sort of preterm birth, not only amongst women in general in the United States, but amongst black women. So that study said induced abortion is an important risk factor for preterm birth. When you think about the consequences or the possible outcomes for abortion that could harm women, they're not only physical, but they're also emotional. But again, I want to start with why. 
Why would it be possible for abortion to hurt a woman emotionally? Well, I think it's important to consider for a moment, if a woman had her appendix removed, would she say she felt empty, the way the women I quoted at the beginning, after their abortions, talked about feeling empty? Would they feel that innocence had been removed from them if their appendix was removed, the way the one woman mentioned she felt her innocence had been taken from her as a result of having an abortion? I don't think so. Why? Let's start with why. Because removing your appendix is removing a human part. But removing the pre-born child is removing a human being. That's a very important distinction. And that would ultimately be why abortion would harm some women emotionally, because of what the act of abortion does, robbing them of their pre-born children. Now some people say, well, it's not a human yet. Well, let's look at what embryology texts tell us about when life begins. Moore and Persaud have authored a number of different embryology texts used by medical students across North America. And in their text, Before We Are Born, it says, human development is a continuous process that begins when an oocyte from a female is fertilized by a sperm from a male. Layman's embryology says the development of a human begins at fertilization. That is well accepted scientifically that beings which reproduce sexually begin their lives at fertilization. And yet there are some people who will say, no, life begins before or after fertilization. Well, let's consider those three options. We've got before, we have at, and then we have after. We know life can't begin before fertilization because sperm in a man's body by itself will not grow into a fetus, infant, toddler, or teen. Neither will an egg in a woman's body by itself. And yet, when they come together at fertilization, the genetic information that distinguishes this young child from all of us, that was determined not at the infant stage, not at the fetal stage, but was determined at fertilization. She can't trace her beginning back to the sperm or the egg, but she can trace her beginning back to the one-celled embryo. Sometimes we have a hard time imagining how something so small could exist as each of us are individual human beings with our unique genetic DNA. How could that be? Well, I think an analogy to help us understand that is an analogy to this, a Polaroid picture. This is a picture that if we had it, imagine we hadn't taken it yet. Imagine it was just a white card. Well, we wouldn't call it a picture. We would just say it's a white card. But if you put it into a camera, you snap a photo when the card comes out, do you see the picture right away? No, you see brown black smudges. But everything about the image that will develop in a few moments is captured the instant you take the photo. It just needs time to develop. Before you put the, cam the picture in, you have a potential image. But the moment you take the picture, you have an image with great potential. Before fertilization, you have a potential human. But at fertilization, you have a human with great potential. The way the fetus, the infant, and the young child are humans with great potential. I'd like us to think for a moment, do we believe in human rights? And if the answer is yes, then the next question is, who gets human rights? And if the answer is humans, then the next question is, what about that human in the center there? And someone may say, well, it's not human. And so my question is, what are her parents? And if her parents are human, then it logically follows she's human. And someone may say, but it's not alive. And my question is, is it growing? If that one-celled embryo is growing, she's alive. And we know from one cell to two to four to eight to 16 and so forth, by virtue of her growth, she's alive. By virtue of having human parents, she's human. And therefore, if we believe in human rights, then the one cell embryo has the same rights as you or me. Since life begins at fertilization, then the act of abortion, something which happens after fertilization, is going to end that life. And the facts of the abortion procedure prove that. If we look here, we see a nine-week abortion. The child is sucked out. We see the hands and the feet. We look here, Dr. Fellows does abortions up to 23 weeks and six days. We see what abortion looks like here. Let's see these images come to life to be able to make a decision about the effects of abortion on the child and the woman. This is graphic.
abortion harm women emotionally because it does that to her child. That is why it harms women emotionally. But not just because I say so, but because studies have shown that. In Ferguson et al., in the British Journal of Psychiatry, a study was reported in 2008, the evidence is consistent with the view, it said, that abortion may be associated with a small increase in risk of mental disorders. Then, in 2011, a study by Coleman, published in the British, the British Journal of Psychiatry, was a meta-analysis of 22 published studies, 36 effects, bringing together data of almost 900,000 women with participants of almost 200,000 that had experienced abortion. Her results? Nearly 10% of the incidence of all mental health problems was shown to be directly attributable to abortion. I'll explain more in my other remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and we'll invite Dr. Fellows up for his 20-minute opening remarks. Good evening. Does abortion help women or does abortion harm women? Um, I'll just give you a brief uh, description of uh, my interpretation of this question uh, over the next few minutes. Women seeking abortion obviously face a conundrum. On the one hand, Childbearing is an event that they aspire to or have already experienced. Seeking an abortion is the last resort of a desperate woman. Desperation is the circumstance that drives women to accomplish an abortion. Documentation over the years has confirmed that women will obtain an abortion whether or not it's legal or safe. The Fittmacher Institute in the United States of America publishes on a regular basis pregnancy outcomes. Over the past 10 years, they have shown worldwide that there are about 205 million pregnancies per year. Of these, 4.2 million of them end in an elective abortion. Half of the abortions occur in countries where it's legal, and half of the abortions occur in countries where abortions are illegal. The big difference is that in countries where it's illegal or banned, the incidence of illness or death is much higher for instance, resulting in 2003 of 77,000 deaths directly attributed to the abortions in the legal countries, and much more morbidity related to these, infection, hemorrhage, and infertility. And this is because the abortions, of course, were carried out by non-skilled providers, backstreet abortions. Between 1980 and 1989, the reigning governors of Romania, a husband and wife team known as the Ceausescu's, unwittingly showed what happens when you deny women choice. Abortions and contraception during that 10 years were banned. This was enforced by the government and women were persecuted for seeking or having abortions. This resulted in maternal mortality compared to the rest of Europe um, following. You can see that the abortion rate per 100,000 uh, live births in all of the countries near or around Romania remained under 20, except for Russia. In Romania, during that 10-year interval, it was 30 times higher. These are maternal deaths related to criminal abortions. Even in our own province of Ontario, we showed what happens when access to abortion, or legal, legal or safe abortion, occurs, uh, having been previously denied. Subsequent to Roe v. Wade in 1969 in the United States, women, women of Ontario were also allowed to seek abortion, having previously been denied this service or choice. Internal morbidity and mortality fell by 50% in the province within two years of instituting this access to legal abortion. What I've said thus far are facts, are the facts of denying women access to abortion worldwide, countrywide, and province-wide in our own backyard. The facts don't lie. Abortion is a necessary requisite to providing health care to women. To deny this service is to expose them 
to death and injury. Abortion is not their first choice. Prevention was their first choice. However, this is, for many different reasons, not always possible. The focus on preventing pregnancy would seem to be a more productive strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fellows. So we'll now have the period of cross-examination. So each of them will be able to take seven minutes to ask questions of the other person. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Fellows. Uh, you have seven minutes to do the cross-examination with Stephanie. Uh, my first question, Stephanie, is really uh, relates to uh, the, the information that you're providing our audience about uh, and I was disappointed that you started off with the uh, issue of breast cancer. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, have said un without any question uh, that there is no uh, association between breast cancer and a woman having an abortion. This is a time sort of flogged uh, question which uh, was presented, I thought it was no longer under discussion, but we were brought to the board here today, so I would just have to ask you, um, I know you can give us some meta-analyses of individuals who looked over uh, the question, but when it's such posterior groups as the Society of Obstetricians in Canada, the International uh, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists uh, worldwide, and the American College have all denied uh, that there's any association with the this is this is a very weak uh, argument to and an emotional argument. Obviously, breast cancer is is a very concerning cancer for women and for anybody, men and women. And to put that up as as an emotional ploy to uh, attract people to support or deny them access to abortion, you can't argue with the huge numbers that I've given you, which are. Massive, you know, 4.2 million abortions a year with the kinds of death and destruction that occur with women that don't have access to abortion. See? Well, I have right in front of me um, each objection the American Cancer Society has and a response to it about how the studies they rely on uh, are fraudulent. Um, I, if you want to give me one of your specific objections, I can give you my specific response. Uh, but I guess my question back to you would be, what's uh, your take on hormone replacement therapy? Do you think it's a problem? Well, we changed channels here. Uh, hormone replacement therapy um, is unquestionably uh, a, a replacement of hormones that women in the menopause, C, it is not without risk. There's a very big study that was done in the uh, International Women's Health Initiative which showed that hormone replacement therapy um, in, uh, well, I'll give you the specifics. There were 10,000 women in a, in a group of 10,000 women who didn't have hormones compared to a group of women who did have hormone replacement therapy. 10,000 in both groups. The incidence of breast cancer in women who had hormone replacement therapy was 38 per 10,000, and the women who didn't have hormone replacement therapy was 30 per 10,000. So that's a statistically significant difference. This has nothing to do with abortion. We're talking about abortion. We're not talking about uh, exogenous hormone replacement therapy. My purpose for asking the question was to get a sense. So am I correct in understanding that you would you see the risks to it, that there's danger? Okay. But my point then is, for 20 years, there was research pointing out to that, and it was rejected until the past decade. So my point is, if you say, oh, well, that there are authorities that are, are, are saying that there's no link between abortion and breast cancer, well, that's what was once being said about HRT, and now it is being uh, considered and questioned and doubted. So that, that's one of my responses. Um, yeah, well, the Cochrane study has shown a big group in the uh, other Britain has shown unquestionably looking at it carefully. You're right, there was 
There was not a lot of scientific data looked at carefully. She says there wasn't good hormone replacement therapy until this women's health initiative occurred. Once the women's health initiative occurred, there was no question that obstetricians and gynecologists were remiss in not making sure that the information they were feeding to their patients was correct. Now we feed them the information that, yes, there are risks to HRT, just like there's risks to driving your car. If you want to take those risks, here they are. As far as abortion and breast cancer, no. There's never been any associated risk associated, and no, no risk associated with abortion and breast cancer. Um, do you agree that uh, estrogen exposure is a risk, to, uh, a risk factor for developing breast cancer? I would say that um, we don't fully understand the pathophysiology of breast cancer. Obviously, there must be some association with a woman's production of estrogen and breast cancer. Just like there is an association with progesterone and testosterone in breast cancer. Some breast cancers have estrogen sensitivity or estrogen receptors. Some have progesterone receptors. Some have testosterone receptors. So all of these hormones are endogenously produced in the woman. Um, but um, whether or not, so if you're saying that abortion causes uh, breast cancer, actually you end the pregnancy, so the, the estrogen levels fall. So. Okay, one more question, and it relates to, uh, it's not really a question, it's more of a commentary on um, incompetent cervix. You mentioned incompetent cervix in association with uh, having an abortion. Once again, um, these questions have been carefully looked at by uh, various groups, and there is no evidence that a woman has, who has an abortion has any higher incidence of an incompetent cervix. An incompetent cervix, if you didn't know, is one where the woman is prone to uh, losing the pregnancy because the cervix is unable to contain the pregnancy until it's uh, uh, mature, viable. There's no evidence in the literature to support that side. Again, I, it's sort of appealing to an emotional side, I think, rather than a factual side as to what the risks are. So are you saying there's I'm not saying there's no risk to abortion. There's, again, there's risk to driving your car. There's risk to having an operative procedure or a medical abortion. Medical surgical abortions carry risks. We discuss these risks with them. Risks are infection, bleeding, damage to the ears. In a small portion of women, these are, these are things that happen. Skilled providers, however, can avoid these things. No, nothing is without risk that we're at risk sitting here right now. Thank you. So the um, the next section of cross examination will be Dr. Stephanie um, able to ask questions of Dr. Dr. Oh whoops. <laughs> this is Stephanie. Um, Dr. Fellows, uh, just to go through a few kind of fact check. Um, was I correct in, in my statement that you do abortions up to 23 weeks and 6 days? Yes, I do. Um, and uh, are the, were the pictures I showed an accurate representation of what you see and what you do? I didn't actually look at the pictures this time. I've seen them before, but uh, pictures are pictures. If you have pictures and you say that's what they are, then that's basically what is involved in doing an abortion. We don't actually visualize things like that, but that's what happens. Right, so just to confirm, last debate, it was the same imagery as last debate, and when she said it was what you see and what you do. So, um, when you do a, a D and E, uh, what's involved in the process? Uh, the woman, uh, first of all, calls the clinic and asks to, uh, and tells her, uh, tells the secretary what her request is. She comes to the clinic and she is screened by a nurse who goes over her history, does a brief physical, and uh, has her answer the questionnaire, and she will then see a social worker, and then she will um, be scheduled for an abortion. If she decides to have an abortion, she has a choice to make at that point, and then she has her cervix prepared the day before, and then the day after that she comes in for her abortion. That's 
basically the routine at our clinic. She has her abortion, if it's over 14 weeks, she has her abortion uh, under general anesthesia. Would you say this size of fetus, a lamp term for young one, would uh, be what the size of some of the babies you abort look like? Some of the babies look like that. And when they come out, do they come out intact? No, uh, they generally don't come out intact. They come out in pieces. Pieces of what? Pieces. They are morselated, it's called, the procedure is called morselation, where they are taken apart. So what would you say this is? Not in terms of the fetal model in my hand, but what you morselate from the woman. What is it? It's a fetus. What kind of fetus? Dolphins have fetuses, dogs have fetuses. I'm wondering what kind of fetus it is. A human fetus. Okay, so uh, do you believe in human rights? I believe in human rights, yeah. Then what about the human fetus's rights? Well, our society has decreed that the fetus does not have rights uh, until the Achieves viability until it achieves until it's born. Basically, yeah. there are no there are no regulations in our society that say the fetus has any rights. The mother has the rights. She has the rights to turn on the outcome of that pregnancy. Does she have the rights to kill her human infant after birth? No, 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 she so what is the difference between the human infant and the human fetus other than age? One is born and the other is not born. And isn't the fetus not born because of how old it is? If we were elephants, we need to be in our mom's bodies for two years. But because we're humans, we need to be in our mom's bodies for nine months. So wouldn't the matter of birth be related inherently to the age of the human? So you're saying whether someone can be killed or not is based on whether they're born or not, correct? Okay, and birth is generally based on how old we are, other than factors like premature delivery, but you have to be about nine months before you're born, correct? Well, we hope that you go roughly to nine months, that's right, before you're born. So to get to nine months implies that we started Blocking the passage of time nine months before, correct? So therefore, aren't we implying that we, be, we believe the life began nine months ago? How are we not? We believe that life, our society and most societies agree that life begins at birth. If life begins at birth, and at 24, 25, and 26 weeks, the fetus is still in the mother's body, not born, why won't you abort it then? We have decided as internationally, and not we, not London, Ontario, not in Ontario, not in Canada, but internationally, we have decided that a fetus is, um, is well, actually in the States they go further than that, but we have decided that a fetus uh, will not be aborted after 23 weeks and six days unless there are some major problems with the fetus. In the States they go further than that. Even though there are no laws in most countries that most modern countries governing when an abortion is conducted until. Uh, basically, we start resuscitating babies at 24 weeks. That's why we don't do abortions after 24 weeks. Because the, the chances of an intact survival are slim at uh, less than 23 weeks and six days. Will you abort a healthy fetus at 20 weeks? Yes. For any reason? When the mother has to want to have that abortion, absolutely. So regardless of the woman's motivation, whatever her reason, you will abort the fetus at 20 weeks? We, we would not, I know you're going with this, we would not condone abortions for sex selection. Okay, but you will for Down syndrome? If that's what the mother wants, yes. What if a woman is pregnant with a fetus that is both female and has Down syndrome? and she actually wants a child with Down syndrome, but doesn't want a female child. Are you saying you won't abort it because her motivation is to get rid of the female? We won't abort it because we 
before the board of fetus on the basis of sex selection. But that same fetus, if her motivation was Down syndrome, you would abort it. So the only difference is the motivation of the mother, not the fetus, is that correct? So why then would you object to a gender abortion? Well, I think because our society does not condone that. When we are, when I, when, when you talk about I will abort, basically we're, we are conducting the business of our society. Um, doing abortions is not something that one is that happy to be doing, but they recognize it as a need of women. We all have things that we do that we don't necessarily want to do, but we do it. And particularly in a profession like medicine, we do it because we are professionals. Thank you, Stephanie, for that cross-examination. Um, the next section will be a rebuttal where each of our debaters will be able to take 10 minutes to rebut and present any other arguments that they might have. Dr. Feldes, you want to start? So, as I said a few seconds ago, um, providing abortion services is not something that um, is easy to do. Um, we all uh, innately relate to uh, being, as I said, that women, one of the joys that women anticipate as a woman is um, usually is having a baby at some point in their lives. And so we see people, we see women coming to our clinic uh, who either have had a child or, or had a child or aspire to have a child. And they find themselves in an untenable position. And these untenable positions, I could list a million untenable positions. I've been doing this for many years. And I can give you a million stories about women who have had situations that have forced them into wanting to have an abortion. Um, and statistics don't lie. The information that I showed you is repeated year after year after year as far as the total number of pregnancies in the world, the total number of abortions each year, roughly the same every year. Half of them in countries where it's legal, half of them in countries where it's illegal. You either provide a safe abortion or you stand by and watch women being victimized, having criminal abortions, and, be, and either dying or becoming ill. Or in the case where, in the Romanian situation that I showed you, a very um, unwitting study that the Ceausescus subjected the population of Romania to, where they denied them contraception and abortion, and they ended up having a maternal mortality rate that was 30 times higher than any other European country, a uh, morbidity rate that, isn't even, that I didn't even talk about, and the phenomenon that I didn't mention, which is Romanian street children, where the children, women who didn't get the abortions, had their child and basically discarded them once they, they came of age when they could eat them around and let somebody else look after them. So, again, doing an abortion is not something that one is proud of, but providing a safe abortion is something to be proud of, and I will continue to do abortions um, as long as the Canadian public is, is wanting this um, procedure to be offered to them. And the latest statistics on acceptance is that 75% of the Canadian population believe in a woman's right to choose. If the Canadian society decides that this is not the case and they want to criminalize abortion, then obviously this posture will have to be rethought. So Okay, thank you. You didn't use all your time, but that's okay. We'll move along. Uh, so, Stephanie, you have 10 minutes for your rebuttal. Okay, let's 
let's take a, a lesson again from Simon Sinek and start with why. Why do women have abortions? Dr. Fellows said it's the last resort of a desperate woman. And I don't doubt that there are many women who find themselves in def desperate circumstances. And it's the lack of support, uh, perhaps the fear of being kicked out of their home, uh, the plans they had for their career or their education, maybe being pregnant from sexual assault. Any number of these can be very, very difficult situations for a pregnant woman to be in. But regardless of what situation she's in, is what we saw on the screen a few moments ago going to unrape a rape victim? Is what we saw on the screen a few moments ago make a woman who's poor suddenly become rich? Is what we saw on the screen a few moments ago going to turn a woman's frog of a partner into a prince? I don't think so. We need to be concerned about women but we have to ask ourselves, why do they want the abortion? And once we identify why, what we realize, abortion isn't actually going to give them what they need, which is the support, the ability to finish school, the counseling they're going to need if they're pregnant from sexual assault. That trauma needs to be dealt with. Lots of things will trigger it, but getting rid of the preborn child is not going to get rid of the memories. So if we truly care about women, wouldn't we ask why do they want this and actually address their problem, not mask it? In fact, Kathy Analick, the psychotherapist who introduced that pro-choice book I mentioned, said at the, in her introduction, I remember a woman I counseled at Planned Parenthood. She had three abortions in two years and chose to keep using the rhythm method. I recall feeling puzzled by her insistence on an obviously ineffective method. A year later, she came to my private office for psychotherapy. She wanted to help, she wanted help rather, in leaving her battering husband. It was he who had forbidden her to use any other form of birth control. Her situation brought home to me the importance of knowing the full context in which women make reproductive choices. Yeah, she's right, we need to know the full context, but why didn't she find it in abortion number one? Why didn't she ask in abortion number two? If this psychotherapist really cared about the patient, why didn't she address the crisis the woman was in by asking, why do you want the abortion? Rather than just giving her the abortion until years later she discovers the woman is being battered. So if we truly cared about women, we'd get to the root of their motivations. Now, in terms of a few things Dr. Fellows said about illegal abortions, well, let's look at our country since he wants to look at our country. Maternal mortality in Canada from 1921 to 1974, as we can see, it's on a steady decline. That whole period up until 1969, abortion was illegal. Now, if Dr. Fellows' premise is correct, that illegal abortion translates into unsafe abortion, then why isn't maternal mortality high in Canada while it's illegal? Why is maternal mortality going down very significantly all the while it's illegal? So this is the evidence to refute Dr. Fellow's claim that illegal abortion translates into unsafe abortion. And I will add, of course, it's never safe for the preborn child. So legal or illegally, it's always going to be unsafe for the preborn child. Now, let's look at The Lancet in 2010. Again, let's take Dr. Fellow's premise that if illegal abortion translates into quote-unquote unsafe abortion, let's look at El Salvador, 1980 all the way up to 2008. We can see maternal mortality is on a steady decline. And look when abortion was prohibited in El Salvador, 1998. And yet in 2000, and then a decade later, the maternal mortality rate is going down. So that refutes Dr. Fellow's claim. Now let's look at Chile. From 1980 again to 2008, maternal mortality going down. 1989 is when abortion was illegal in Chile. So by Dr. Fellow's claim, we would have to think that after 1989, when abortion was illegal, maternal mortality would start going up in Chile. But guess what? It kept going down. Or let's look at Poland. Again, we see abortion was made illegal in 1997. 
And then in 2008, maternal mortality is still on the decline. But if he's right that illegal abortion means women die, then we should see it going up. Same with Nicaragua, maternal mortality continues to go down. Now here's what's interesting about this. Let's look at South Africa. South Africa was where abortion was made legal. In 1997, it was made legal. And in 2008, look at that. Maternal mortality is going up. So Dr. Fellows is giving false information that is refuted not by only our own experience in Canada, but is refuted by The Lancet, which shows that the issue about maternal mortality is not about access to abortion. It's about good medical care. So let's talk about Romania. Why did so many women die? Because it was led, that country was led by a dictator by the name of Ceausescu who was a human rights violator. They weren't really known for being a stellar country while Ceausescu was in charge. So Dr. Fellows, the only kind of really dramatic scenario he gives us is Romania under Ceausescu's regime? Really? That is not a country where they had good medical care at all. That is a country where people's electricity was turned off at certain times of the day. That was a country where people were starving because they couldn't get food. So the issue is not access to abortion. Based on Ceausescu's track record, access to abortion wouldn't have fixed all the other human rights violations that he was involved with. How am I for time? Okay. With regards to Dr. Fellows questioning the evidence on the abortion breast cancer link, as I mentioned, uh, I have all the objections here from the American Cancer Society, which interestingly, what did Dr. Fellows do? He didn't give me a specific objection. He just gave me the American Cancer Society. They, they object to it. Well, tell me why. Because if you tell me why, then I'll come up with a response. But he's appealing to just an authority without actually giving reasons. And I thought he would do that, which is why I went to the authority and I went got every point they made, but he didn't even give me one of their points. So if, again, someone wants to ask a question, I can go through that. But that is there. In terms of the studies, the evidence is here. In fact, there are 34 statistically significant studies. What's also interesting, but, uh, in, interesting about these studies is that a number of them make reference to a growing rate of breast cancer in China, where, of course, there's alarming rates of abortion. Now, please understand, I'm not saying if a woman has an abortion that she's going to get breast cancer, nor am I saying if she has breast cancer that she's had an abortion. I'm just saying it's a risk factor based on evidence that can't be overlooked. And when he cites the fact that a certain body has said, well, there is no evidence, again, let's ask why they make that claim. Let's see if it's good reasoning. But moreover, let's not overlook the fact, which is why I brought up hormone replacement therapy, that historically we have a recent example of something where there was evidence showing the negative consequences, and it was ignored for 20 years until finally there was this widespread acceptance and then suddenly a decrease uh, in, in, in the stats showing the number of women uh, getting breast cancer. So if you give something specific, then it can be refuted. So I provided evidence. Dr. Fellows hasn't given evidence to refute that, and that's what we need to consider. The one final point I want to make is when, in my, the one minute that I have, uh, is, is it's interesting that Dr. Fellows won't abort what we know is a pre-born human, in the age category of fetus as opposed to the age category of infant or toddler. He won't abort the child if she's female if the mother's reason for killing her is female. But that very same child would be killed by Dr. Fellows, would be writ limb by limb. Dr. Fellows would use a crushing, rotating technique as described by the medical literature in Canada for how to do DNEs that he does. He would use a crushing rotating technique on the head of that child. He would do that if the reason was the childhood Down syndrome, or if the reason was anything other but sex-selective abortion. Since when do our human rights get grounded in our gender or the feelings of our parents? Thank you very much.
Stephanie. So uh, each of our um, debaters will have an opportunity for five minute closing remarks. Um, and then after that we'll have time for questions and uh, I will give you instructions for the questions at that point. So we'll start with Dr. Phillips. Can we do a five minute closing? Stephanie keeps mentioning that I make these decisions about women having an abortion. I uh, am at arm's length from the decisions that are made uh, with respect to my patients having abortions. I am a, in this situation, I can tell you that I, over the years, have always made sure that I'm at arm's length from the situation of uh, the woman presenting and the woman receiving her counseling. And the, so when a patient comes to me, basically she has made her decision based on information that she's received from a nurse and a counselor. And this is true of most clinics where they come in, the patients come in, they fill out a questionnaire, and they um, uh, see a nurse uh, with or without a counselor and make the I am not in any way in intimidating them or influencing them as far as their decision. I simply provide a safe uh, access to a legal abortion and uh, at any time the patient from the moment she makes the phone call to the moment where she is actually going to have the procedure, she can change her mind. And, and our experience over the years is that roughly from the time the woman actually makes the call to the actual abortion, 20% of women reconsider their stance or what they decided uh, as far as having an abortion or not um, and they change their mind. And so ultimately, the 80% that have abortion, every woman who has an abortion, I'm sure, has some regret. They have regret that they had to have an abortion. Some of them feel guilty about having an abortion. Some of them feel guilty about the fact that they didn't prevent the pregnancy, as Stephanie points out. Recidivism is about 20% of women, at least, experience uh, a recurrent problem for various reasons. Sometimes they're being battered. Sometimes they're just stupid. They just don't think about it. Sometimes they are so caught up with the other issues that are going on in their lives that they don't take the time to take to make uh, to make that uh, choice as to having uh, prevention, preventing the pregnancy. So I uh, I disclaim the fact that I am responsible for sex selection or anything like that. I simply follow what uh, Canadian society has decreed, and that is that a woman has a right to choose. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fellows. And so Stephanie will finish up with her five-minute closing remarks, and then we'll get to questions. ends with the woman has a right to choose it's actually a grammatically incorrect sentence choose what what does the woman have the right to choose abortion is assumedly what he means well what is abortion and only when we define what abortion is can we determine whether she has a right to choose that or not the evidence is clear that the act of abortion is choosing to end the life of one's offspring. The idea that the preborn are human beings is not just something that Moore and Persaud's embryology teaches us, it's actually something that Dr. Alan Goodmacher of the Planned Parenthood organization that supports, promotes, and does abortions conceded. In 1933, as far back as then, he said, we of today know that man is born of sexual union, that he starts life as an embryo within the body of the female, and that the embryo is formed from the fusion of two cells, the ovum and the sperm. This seems so simple, said Dr. Guttmacher of Planned Parenthood. This seems so simple and evident to us that it is difficult to picture a time when it was not part of common knowledge. Two decades later, in 1952, Planned Parenthood had a brochure on birth control. 
they answered a little, a few questions, you know, um, questions about birth control, and, and one of them was, is birth control an abortion? And Planned Parenthood's pamphlet said, definitely not. Abortion requires an operation. It kills the life of a baby after it has begun. End quote. Planned Parenthood, 1952. So when Dr. Fellow says a woman has a right to choose, that is what he's saying a woman has a right to choose. The fetal model I held in my hand, him pulling it limb by limb, crushing, extracting, disposing, that is what Dr. Fellows says a woman has a right to choose. He completely ignored the fact that doing that will have emotional consequences for the woman. That book I mentioned, again, is a pro-choice book that is conceding there are women who are traumatized by their abortions. Not all, but certainly some. Then, as I got to the end of my closing remarks, there have been studies to back this up. Back to the Coleman study that was in the British Journal of Psychiatry, here's what it reported. And again, as a reminder, this was overlooked, this is looking over 22 published studies that had 36 effects, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of women who were looked at in all of these studies. And it says overall, women with an abortion history experience an 81% increased risk for mental health problems. The results show that the level of increased risk associated with abortions varies from 34% to 230% depending on the nature of the outcome. She goes on to say separate effects were calculated based on the type of mental health outcome with the results revealing the following. The increased risk for anxiety disorders, 34%. For depression, 37%. For alcohol use and abuse, 110%. For marijuana use and abuse, 220%, and for suicide behaviors, it was 155%. Should we be surprised, based on what abortion does, that ending the life of our offspring is going to have psychological consequences for us? Dr. Fellows didn't refute that. When it came to the abortion breast cancer link, he didn't refute that. Again, I have all the studies here, and I have the 34 that are statistically significant that include the World Journal of Surgical Oncology, Medical Oncology. The evidence is here. He didn't refute it. He can't say they're not human. He concedes it's a human fetus. And so the only thing we're left with is claim that some women will die from illegal abortions, which has been refuted by the Lancet Journal and our own experience in Canada. So if we truly care about women as well as human rights, then we should look for ways to help women through their difficult circumstances in such a way that we don't end the life of their pre-born children. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you everybody for your respect and um, you're allowing the debaters to have their space to give their arguments. We're now going to get to the question period. So we're going to have lineups on either side. I'd like to be able to get to uh, four questions, and if they're brief, possibly more. The format for it is going to be, uh, we're going to have questions for, directed at Stephanie on, on my left, your right, and questions for Dr. Fellows on uh, the audience left. So if uh, you guys want to line up, the way it'll work is uh, if we get up one person from your group at each end here just to um, be the head of the line. And uh, what we'll do is after the question is asked, and um, I'll, I'll just have you guys be very brief because if you're not brief then I have to cut you off and I don't have many muscles to cut you off with. So, um, What's going to happen is uh, whoever the question is for, they will have two minutes to answer, and then the other debater will have another one minute to be able to rebut the answer to the question. So we will start um, on either side, and we'll have an even amount of questions on either side. All right, we'll start over here first, Stephanie. Both 
harmful and also helpful for an individual woman. The question was, um, as far as the result of the, the debate, um, that abortion is harmful to women, um, and both of our debaters took a different side of, of it being uh, Stephanie focusing on the harm to women and Dr. Fellows focusing on it being helpful to women and whether this is mutually exclusive. All right, Stephanie? Thank you. Well, in terms of the result of the debate, I stayed within the parameters of really focusing on what I was asked to do, which is focus on the harms to women. Um, and if we say that having an abortion is helpful to a woman in crisis, well, it may seem helpful insofar as the immediate, you know, burden of the unplanned pregnancy and the crisis that she's in may seem alleviated, but what kind of civil society says that ending the life of one's offspring is an acceptable solution to help them through difficult circumstances? So I would object to the idea that ultimately this is helpful, because I don't think killing our children is a a helpful thing to do for us emotionally uh, as well as physically, but even if uh, someone could argue it was helpful to them, then we would have a society just, you know, rife with human rights violations where one human can say, well, it helped me to hurt him, so so that's why I did it, and isn't that why we have court and laws to try to stop people from doing that? Dr. Phillips. Well, I mean, the help, um, there's no question, as I said earlier, that um, the woman is caught in a conflict of interest. On the one hand, she innately, at some point in her life, probably wishes to be pregnant. On the other hand, the circumstances she finds herself in puts herself at, in a conundrum that she has to choose what is best for her under those circumstances at that time. So it is helpful and harmful, for sure. Thank you. I'm going to take a question from the other side. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, my question is for Dr. Fellows. Uh, <clears throat> just with a really brief reflection and observation, Stephanie did address a lot of the points that came up in my own mind. Uh, I would say my observation and my question are both regarding irony. I thought it was kind of ironic the fact that Stephanie, Stephanie, you are a Catholic, I suppose. Um, the fact that today there's a perception that embracing the apparently mythical or the religious, and I say this because I spent uh, a number of years studying in Rome, I studied philosophy and there was a program. Just trying to get the yeah, question. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, the point is, by embracing the supposed mythical, uh, Stephanie has done a much better job of embracing the empirical and the facts. Her facts were much better lined up than yours. Uh, the best you could do is an ambiguous example of Romania. My question is, you have, you claim to really have no freedom when the woman comes and has decided to abort. So it's kind of ironic because together with the child, you're aborting your own freedom to choose whether or not to do it. So my question is, how do you justify that? So your, your question is that I don't have Freedom to make a choice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I I agree with you. I I decided long ago that I would provide the a safe abortion to a woman if she went through a process that we provide them, which is um, to be interviewed, to be deemed to be compass mentis, and to deemed to be non coerced and to have made a choice in her own free will that she no longer wished to become to, to uh, maintain this pregnancy. So I have, you're right. I, I would, um, I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I abrogate that role of making the decision to 
the patient, and I have confidence that with our screening tools that she is making that choice, um, and I'm providing her a service that is safe and uh, effective. Stephanie, any comment? I think a false dilemma is created where our options are legal abortion or illegal abortion. And there is a third path, and it's simply no abortion. That a woman in crisis get help and assistance through her pregnancy rather than in, a, um, in an abortion providing hospital or, or clinic. Uh, again, if we truly care about women, we would ask the question, why do you want this? Because it's only in asking why that we begin to understand the woman's crisis. Case in point, there's a physician in Canada whose patient requested a sex selective abortion. And the physician sought to find out why the patient wanted it and found out the patient was raised in a home in which she was taught to believe her life was meaningless because she was a girl. She was frequently locked in a closet and then thrown out into the street when it was cold. So she didn't really want to kill a child. She just didn't want a child to suffer that way. Yes. By the way, Stephanie is <laughs> okay, so please keep the questions brief so we can hear from our debaters. We'll come over here. So the question was about uh, reconciling the two examples, uh, one of Chile and one of Romania, both of which had a military dictatorship during the periods that Stephanie was quoting. It brought up the fact that Ceausescu was the human rights violator that he was to demonstrate that there were problems well beyond what Dr. Fellows is saying about access to abortion and that the real problem in Romania was how he was leading the people. There are other factors in terms of um, where healthcare was, and my core point was that what really matters is good medicine and good healthcare, and that that's what needs to be provided. Because if you actually look at the numbers of um, uh, the, the countries where you have the highest mortality rates, it's like the Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of them. It's countries where you don't have good medical care, and that was my fundamental point. But ultimately, we just have to look at the stats, and the stats refute what Dr. Fellows was saying. Dr. Fellows, any comments? Okay. Okay, another question from the other side. I'll, I'll repeat it. Oh, sure. Dr. Fellows, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so very much for coming and presenting this evening. As a physician, I wanted to challenge a little bit your, your comments with regards to um, physicians needing to do what society deems is appropriate. But we look throughout medical history, of course, physicians have capitulated on issues in it in the Nazi regime, uh, for example, in South Africa during apartheid. If we look through our medical history from Hippocrates onwards, the heroes of medicine have been those that have done what's right, regardless of what society says. Do you think that as physicians, we should go along with doing things just because society says it's okay? Dr. Fellows. Um, that's a very good question, and I think uh, you know each physician has to decide in their in their own mind um, what their posture is in this question. I mean, I agree with you that there have been throughout uh, civilization there have been situations where physicians have been put in situations where they have done things according to not what they wanted to do, but what the government or whoever has told them to do. I think in the situation of providing abortion. No question that it is not it is not an easy thing to provide abortions. It is a contract, and 
I'm fundamentally conflicted by the idea that the pregnancy is ending. However, um, I am confident in looking at um, the statistics and the information that I've talked about, which is well-founded, statistically well-based, and I experience what happened to women pre or v weight. I've been in practice long enough to know, uh, working in the emergency departments, I would see women come into the emergency departments victimized by criminal abortions. And um, I made a conscious decision at that time, based on that and, and the information that continues to flow from the world. But what happens to women when you don't give them a choice? Women are desperate and they become, uh, and they put themselves and their families and the children that they may have in their family um, at great risk. So it's not an easy decision for sure, but it's one that I've done, given a lot of thought to. Thank you, Stephanie. If abortion is such a great thing, why would he be conflicted? If he is conflicted, why is he doing it? Uh, Dr. Fellows is in direct violation of the nature of the medical profession. The CMA, in its code of medical ethics, says that there must be compassion and efficiency, not efficiency, and respect for persons. There's also multiple policies from the CMA about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, guidelines for low risk drinking, in which doctors are to tell their patients, don't drink, don't do drugs while you're pregnant. So there's a contradiction where on one hand we're saying, don't do this because it will harm your baby, but hey, I'll, I'll sign up to, to kill your baby if you want. The CMA Code of Ethics also says to refuse to participate in or support practices that violate basic human rights. And the basic human right is the right to be, the right to life. Thank and since we were human, they have that right. Okay, next question over here. We're going to mobilize the mic for Stephanie. Hi, so um, just two quick questions about, um, I'm not sure whether I missed it uh, in your presentation, but it seems like they weren't covered. Um, first would be, um, what about um, like uh, drug-induced abortions, chemical abortions? So a lot of emotional impact around surgical procedures and statistics presented either way as to which, one, which person would, uh, as to whether it would damage the women or not, but that didn't seem to be covered. And the other thing was, uh, there were a lot of statistics presented on mortality from abortions and where they were provided or outlawed. Does, um, has there been any studies that included alternatives in there? Because it didn't seem like it was being announced, like it was a yes or no type thing. Were there any third point alternatives, like promoting more adoptive services or something that affected the rates? So I guess it's a question to both of you. Thank you very much. In terms of uh, your question about uh, the risks of chemical abortion or medical uh, abortion, I guess there are risks with that as well. I chose to focus on a few things rather than many things. So at this point, I would just point you in the direction of resources that have information about that. So the Weaver Institute, I have one of their books with me, uh, will have more background uh, on that. So I focus specifically on surgical uh, rather than chemical. And I'm not, I'm not quite sure where you were, were going with um, in terms of alternatives. I think we absolutely have to encourage uh, things like adoption, which interestingly is often the least chosen option. In, in people's minds. I've spoken to many people who say in one breath, I support abortion, and I say, what about adoption? And they say, I could never do that. So again, let's start with why. Why would a woman have a hard time doing that? Well, because by the time you adopt, you've fallen in love with your baby, and then you've gone through painful labor for your baby, and you're gonna to wanna to hold your baby, and you're not gonna to wanna to place your baby in the arms of someone else. And that's understandable, that would be hard. And so because of that, that's often the least favorable option. Whereas abortion says, before I bond, before I feel you, before I look pregnant, I'll get rid of you. So it's all about keeping our distance, which interestingly is what Dr. Fellows has to do to rationalize what he does. I don't know if he said it today, but in our previous debate, he called himself a technician. And he very much laid out the social worker does this, the nurse does this, the counselor does this, I just come in. By the time they see me, they really want it. It's keep the distance. So he can blame the social worker, the social worker can blame him, the counselor can blame the nurse, the nurse can blame, and no one is feeling personally responsible. So medical abortion is an alternative, and uh, most centers will offer medical abortion. Uh, 
it's, it's a much safer operation in the context of uh, the drugs that are available now. RU-486 will be available in Canada. Um, I think the, the second point that you brought up about alternatives, adoption, I, I'm all for adoption. I mean, certainly this is something that we discuss with the patients as one of the alternatives when they come into the clinic. Uh, unfortunately, the infrastructure of our society is not uh, consistent with operating that in a realistic way. Um, so um, keeping the child and uh, giving it up for adoption uh, rarely has a, 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 uh, rarely is attractive to uh, a woman who finds herself uh, pregnant and not wanting to be, in our society at least. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to the other side. A question for Dr. Fellows. Dr. Fellows, um, you conceded that women might regret having had an abortion. I have two questions for you. Have you ever had a woman come back to you who's had an abortion and told you that she regretted it? Secondly, have you ever looked in the mirror into your own eyes and asked yourself if you regret performing an abortion? Have you ever looked at your hands and wondered both the lives that have been ended? Have you ever regretted So we'll, we'll just take one of the questions, Dr. Fellows. I'll let you choose which one you'd like to take. Certainly I've had patients come back and say that they look back in retrospect and say they regret having an abortion. I think, uh, as I said earlier, I think that most women, as they, in the cruel light of day, they look back in retrospect, uh, and it, given what has happened to their lives since the abortion, and they could say, maybe I shouldn't have done that. So, and every woman, as I said, I think every woman who becomes pregnant doesn't want to be, with almost every circumstance, regrets that it's happened and that they've had to have an abortion. But people move on from this. And uh, at that time, that was the decision they had to make. That was the right decision. I always tell patients, whatever decision you make, this will be the right decision. Stephanie. Well, whatever decision a patient wants to make isn't always the right decision. It depends on what we're talking about. So uh, female genital cutting is, is not permissible in the medical community. It's condemned. It's, it, doctors are not allowed to even refer to someone who would do that. So there are some things that we do say, even if my patient wants to do this to their child, I'm not. I can't participate in it. So if we won't allow uh, ourselves to participate in our patient's desire to cut their child's genitals, then why would we work with our patient to help them uh, cut their child's body parts up entirely? Um, women look back, some women look back acknowledging regret, I think because we failed in helping them look forward. You know, in that moment of crisis, we didn't help explore the questions, why do you want this? And, what would your future look like five and ten years from now in each of these scenarios? So maybe fewer will look back if in the moments of crisis we help them look forward. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one question on either side. So we'll start over here with Stephanie. A question for Stephanie. My question for Stephanie has actually already been asked, so if you don't mind, I prefer asking the question for both or more, a little bit more into it, the student doctor here. Um, you mentioned you don't want to do abortions after 25, 26 weeks, but you are happy to do it up to 20 weeks. With the differentiating factor being that at 25 weeks, if you put a baby in an incubator, they can, there's already medical health technology available. Does that mean you think that the technology we have defines the start of the life of that baby or the humanity of that baby? If we have technology that allowed a baby at two weeks to live, would you do abortions only up to two weeks? Where does the life, where does the humanity of that baby come from in your mind? Is it just defined by the technology or is it defined by an intrinsic human definition? So the actual timeline is 23 weeks and 6 days, but interestingly enough, um, last weekend, the Canadian Pediatric Society was um, redefining what they, uh, I believe, they will come out and redefine what they consider to be a time when they would start actively resuscitating babies, and they're dropping the gestation leave down to 23 weeks. I think when that happens, and um, 
uh, intact outcomes um, are much more likely and predictable, then um, I think Canadian society will also dictate that abortions will not be done beyond 23 weeks. Right now, because of the fact that outcomes, the, the chance of death and or uh, severe uh, disability are very high, under 23 weeks and six days, uh, that's probably what determines uh, the gestational limit, both in, not only in Canada, but in Europe, in France, England, South Africa, Australia. So with this change, I think there could be a reduction. So it's all related to impact outcomes. Thank you. See, even when Dr. Pelsman referenced to 23 weeks and six days or 23 weeks, he's, in, he's conceding that life actually began 23 weeks ago or 23 weeks and six days ago. Otherwise, we wouldn't be labeling it 23 weeks. We'd say day one. So there's this admission that life began that period of time that we're, we're claiming the child is the age the child is at. So it's this concession life begins with fertilization and an unwillingness to protect the life because of its ability to survive on its own. And generally in our society, our standard is if you're more vulnerable, we have to help you more, not less. If any of us demand our parents feed us, they're not going to go to jail for not feeding us. But if we're two and we demand our parents feed us and they don't, they will go to jail for not feeding us. What's the difference between a two-year-old and us? Dependency, vulnerability, need. So the, the pre-born child is more needy but that makes us more responsible. And, and finally, let's remember, pregnancy is not a disease. We're not talking about a pathology. So why would we do a surgery or administer drugs where there's no presence of a pathology, where the body is functioning right? Thank you. So um, if there was no question on the side for Stephanie, I would just ask if Dr. Fellows, you're okay with one more question for you? Okay, so we'll just finish up on this side. Thank you. <laughs> so, Dr. Pellis, uh, um, I'm just uh, a little bit curious about your motivation of coming here tonight, and so maybe this is a little soft of a question, but um, it, seems, uh, it seems to me that Stephanie and perhaps many people in this room uh, view you or, or what you're doing as infanticide or, or murder, essentially, or homicide. And, um, and so, coming to an event like this, one that is being hosted by the Students of the Life, um, you know, they had their stopthekilling.ca on the thing, and, and, and I, I watched some of the CCDR's YouTube videos, and there is a certain uh, uh, editorial selection of clips that are put online, shall we say. So, um, and, and I understand that, like, they, there's this very strong political motivation, or, or, or a societal, or, you know, uh, emotional motivation they have in, in this, but um, for you to come here, it, it, it does seem to me that, um, very much in a way you're opening yourself up to, um, uh, like, I'm not trying to say this, but very much opening yourself up to um, being attacked and, and being, uh, you know, treated as a child killer. And I, I'm very curious as to how that, like, what do you think about that? Like, why you're willing to put yourself in this position? Thank you. I think abortion is a default position for a woman. And um, I, I come here um, because I think that it's important for us as a society to, to not become complacent about the issue of abortion. I don't think, I think it's, it's, a, um, it's a scar on our society that we don't have the level of sophistication necessary to help all women avoid themselves um, becoming pregnant and not wanting to be. Um, about 10 years ago, I think the average Russian woman had the average number of abortions the Russian, Russian woman had was eight. Average number of abortions. Our society is somewhat better than that. Um, I think Canada-wide there are probably 100,000 abortions per year. We, we can do much better than this. And as I said in my last slide, we need to focus on preventing these women from becoming pregnant. So I'm here to acknowledge that, yes, I do abortions. Am I happy about doing abortions? I'm only happy in the sense that I'm providing a safe service. But I agree with an, uh, an opinion that says abortion, we shouldn't be doing abortions. We have a fairly sophisticated society. 
You can do a lot of things well. We need to do the prevention of pregnancy a lot better. We need to help women who are uh, in situations where they're being abused or in a violent situation or being raped. We need to address these issues so that they don't find themselves pregnant and not wanting to be. Thank you. Stephanie, any final comment? And again, I think we need to focus on that question, why? You know, why does Dr. Fellows say eight women, or women in Russia having an average of eight abortions each, uh, we're better than that? Well, why would we think that? What's wrong with having eight abortions? If there's something wrong with eight abortions, then isn't there something wrong with one abortion? And whatever's wrong with eight is wrong with one, and therefore, why would we be even participating in that one thing? So. I guess in my last 30 seconds, I'll just close with uh, the words of a single mother I met, a university student who was pressured to abort and chose to carry a term. Her baby got sick after birth, and the only way to keep her baby from waking up at night was to let the baby sleep on her chest. And uh, what she said was, to me, it represents letting my baby sleep on my chest. What we do as mothers, that we stop looking at ourselves as individuals with needs, and we begin to look at how we can serve another, and therefore love another. And with that comes learning to love. Thank you. Okay, let's give a So I want to thank you for being here. Um, it's it's tense, isn't it, to talk about something that's contentious in our society? And regardless of where you stand on the issue. It's not easy, right? And I think our debaters handle this very well and in their own ways. And we all will uh, take something from this, I think. And I am very grateful to all of you for being respectful to each other and going out into the world, being respectful to people who you meet on the street who have a wide variety of experiences. You know, this is uh, not an easy issue, but I think. Um, the people in this room are to be commended for uh, having a good discussion on this uh, in an honest way um, that is not, you know, disrespectful or loud or rude to one another. And I think um, what we've done tonight is a model for our country in being able to dialogue with each other when we have different opinions. So thank you very much. <laughs>